I'm so honored to have Mr. Sam Baker with us today. Mr. Baker is a Marine Corps veteran and an author of several books. Mr. Baker, sir, how are you? I'm just fine. And Thanks I for... Thank you so much for inviting me to be on your show. Oh, we're, we're honored to have you, sir. It's a, it's a really big deal here. So thank you for making the time for us. Um, if we could, we'll just take a moment because I always ask our guests, you know, if you could tell us a little bit about your time in the service, you know, what led you to join and some of your travels, if you could elaborate on that for a moment or two. Well, uh, I was a sophomore at college when Pearl Harbor happened and uh, none of us knew where Pearl Harbor was. If they had said Honolulu, uh, we would have known. So sure. the uh, library was was overflowing with people looking to see where in the heck is Pearl Harbor. Uh -huh. And uh, then, of course, you know, the next day or the next two days, the papers were flooded with pictures of the battleships sinking and all. And it was a miserable sight. I mean... Uh, we were all uh, dumbfounded that the Japanese could impose this much damage to us. And the feeling of patriotism flooded the campus. I mean, everybody was uh, looking, well, how can I help my government? In which way? Sure. And uh, a friend of mine in my engineering class, his brother came to campus to recruit uh, for the Marine Corps, and I got a uh, the forms from him. I was only 19, so I couldn't sign it myself. I had to oh. get my parents to sign it. Yeah, had to have permission. <laughs> and uh, my mother was dying of cancer. She only lived another month. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father signed it. They, My mother questioned me, do you really want to go? And I said, yes. And she signed it. And uh, I needed a birth certificate. So I went to Jackson I, I had to hitchhike. We didn't have any money. The fare was a dollar and a half from my hometown of Clarksdale, Mississippi, to Jackson. But a dollar and a half was a lot of money. Sure. I was eating for $20 a month in the school cafeteria. So a dollar and a half <laughs> meant a lot. And so I hitchhiked to Jackson, got there about noon, uh, found the uh, Office of Vital Statistics, and at 1 o'clock when they opened, I went to get a birth certificate and the man looked and he looked and he looked and he, after a while he said, uh, he leaned over and he said, son, did your parents ever talk to you about something? I said, what? He said, about being adopted. I said, oh no, I know I, I was born in the hospital. So I said, let me look at it. And there was a name, Leonard Samuel Baker, with the wrong birthday, the 16th of, of August instead of the 26th. Oh. That was the date Charles Levine was born. The doctor died, should have retired. But uh, uh, <laughs> I had no choice but to get that. And then when I went to the Marine Corps, the sergeant, World War I sergeant, was uh, running the office. He said, son, you want to join the Marine Corps? You don't know your own name. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, uh, okay, let's see if you qualify. So uh, the doctor took me for a couple of hours, came back about five o'clock, and he said, yeah, he passes. So the sergeant said, you know, you got to go home and get all these recommendations and uh, change, and you got to get your principal to say that uh, Leonard Samuel Baker and Samuel Baker are the same and come back here. I said, okay. He said, how are you going to get home? I said, I'm going to hitchhike. He said, no, I don't want you on the highway at night. So his his fatherly instincts took over. <laughs> he said, I'm going to give you a chit for a hotel room and uh, two chits for meals, one tonight, one for breakfast, then you go home. And it was all right. Uh, uh, spending the night without any facilities, uh, such as a toothbrush and everything. <laughs> but I made it and uh, got back home Thursday about noon and got my... Uh, Recommendations changed, and the and the principal signed the thing. And Sunday, Saturday morning, I hitchhiked back to Jackson. Got there about noon, and uh, he swore me in. And I went back to school, and um, I didn't hear from him at all from uh, April to August of '43. Mm -hmm. I graduated, and. Uh, uh, 
I uh, got a letter from the Marine Corps, and it was it had uh, plane ticket, it had train tickets in it to um, Atlanta, and from Atlanta to uh, Annecy, South Carolina, where uh, Camp uh, um, um, uh, Camp June, maybe uh, was it down there? Uh, um, um, oh, <laughs> Paris Island. Oh, Paris Island, sure, sure. And we went through boot camp, and before the last semester at college, I started lifting weights because I said I had to be strong to get in the Marine Corps. But nobody told me I should have started running instead of lifting weights. They just wanted you to run. Right. And uh, I made a vow with myself before I got to, uh, to Paris Island that nothing they threw at me was going to make me say no. If they were going to get rid of me, they're going to have to ship me out. Right. I wasn't going to leave on my own. And I found the boot camp rigorous, but not overwhelming. And uh, we finished there. We went to um, Quantico, Virginia for OCS. And um, uh, they had a test at Paris Island. I scored 142 on it. And you had to score 110 in order to to become an officer. And some of them had to redo it. I later found out that was the equivalent of a of a of, of the uh, educational test okay. of and uh, 142 was pretty, pretty good. And so we finished at Quantico, and they sent me to Camp Lejeune uh, for engineering, and they didn't have an engineering. And so I just, uh, they gave me a Jeep, and I drove around and looked at the different things. Uh, I had a map, and one of them showed a desalination plant. So I had never seen that, so I drove out there, and there was a, a sergeant running a, a a gasoline engine taking the heat from the exhaust, boiling water, and taking the power from the engine and and throwing cold water over the coils and uh, condensing the steam into water. And it was a little trickle of fresh water falling into a pot, a uh, uh, canvas bag. And there was um, where the brine uh, was falling was a bucket and there was something red in that bucket. I said to the sergeant, what's that down there? He said, that's a crab. I said, it's good to eat? He said, oh, it's it's delicious. I said, where do you get them? Oh, he said, take the net there and walk down. The, the CCC had dug uh, drainage canals so that the flats would drain and the mosquitoes wouldn't uh, activate. And I went down there every morning and found a crab. And in those days, they were... It was as big as a, a, a dinner plate. <laughs> they That's were crazy. delicious. And uh, from Camp Lejeune, they sent me to Camp Pendleton in, in California. And uh, I was there for seven days. And then they put me on a big ship with a lot of recruits going to Hawaii. And uh, if you know San Diego, there's a Point Loma stretches way down. You get on your ship and you go down. And once you go out to, to sea, you, then you sit the real sea. And I was seasick before we got out of the sight of land. Oh. And by the time we got to Hawaii, I could eat a cracker and hold it down. <laughs> and at uh, Hawaii, uh, it was Hawaii. And <laughs> we enjoyed it tremendously. And uh, uh, the old thing about the Marine Corps, the chief driver came up and said, Lieutenant, uh, uh, you have to be down to ship at noon. And I said, where am I going? He said, I'm just a messenger, sir. You need a ride? I said, sure. So he picked me up at about 1130. And uh, I went down. And I'm telling you, the ship was so big, I couldn't see it all with one eyesight. I had to look from bow to stern. It was enormous. And thank goodness it was solid as a rock out at sea. And uh, so I uh, climbed a gangplank, and a sailor came down and got my bag, saluted the officer of the deck, and he said, Lieutenant, you have to be out on the tarmac here at 1 o'clock. Your platoon is arriving. I get a platoon. So uh, he said, the sailor will show you where your quarters are. I suggest you go to the officer's mess, have lunch, 
and be down here at one o'clock. And I did, and I'm waiting on the tarmac, all standing tall and bright, and I'm getting my platoon. Up drives a bus with bars on it. The bars on the bus, all <laughs> comes these two Marine sergeants, about 6'6", six, six, weighed about 245. They've got side arms on. <laughs> out comes the most <laughs> decrepit looking 12 guys you ever saw. They were from the brig. Yeah. You know, young, young kids who had never tasted beer before got drunk and shot off their mouth at officers and anybody else. <laughs> threw them in the brig. And so they had a chance to, to go to combat and erase all of that. So uh, I put them at ease and I said, I'm not going to mention any words about it. You've had all your chances. If you screw up with me, you're going right back where you came from. But you've got an opportunity to re to reverse all that. Now, nobody aboard this ship knows you're from the brig. I want all of you to go there. They'll show you where your quarters are. You've got the same bunk as everybody else. If you want people to know you're from the brig, you tell them. But I want you all to take a shower, get dressed and in your best uniform, and stay that way. And we'll meet at uh, uh, number seven every night at seven o'clock. I had no trouble with them yeah. at all. We That's got to Guam. I said yeah. goodbye. Yeah. And at Guam, they assigned me an engineering duty out at what was building was Northfield. And I loved it. It was the first engineering work I had done after graduated from college. Ten days later, another bus, another Jeep driver. Lieutenant, you have to be at the airport at noon. I, I said, where am I going? I don't know, sir. He said, I'm just a driver. <laughs> just we so got down there. Yeah. Uh, noon, and there were some other officers I knew, and uh, we we loaded our gear aboard the plane. We said to the sergeant loadmaster, where are we going? I can't tell you, sir, till we get in the air. So we get in the air, and he says, you're going to Guadalcanal, but you've got to stop at an island. We'll, about eight hours, we'll stop and refuel, and then we'll go. So we land on this island, and uh, he's, we hadn't had anything to eat or drink, and so we all rushed over to the officer's mess and had something to eat and some drink. And we came back, and our plane is gone. All our luggage is on the tarmac. <laughs> and we said, what happened? Somebody had a high priority. But go get a, a room, and we'll we'll look you up. Two <laughs> weeks later, <laughs> they said, thank God you came over here. We thought you had lost at sea. And they commandeered somebody else's airplane. And they flew us to Guadalcanal. I joined the six Marines as a junior officer to a platoon leader. And um, Guadalcanal was a, a mountain that had been there and it eroded. And there were flat plains. And in the spine of the island, we were on one side. There was a duplicate on the other side. And uh, all the fighting was over. And uh, I... Uh, I trained my troops for the best I could. I kept them physically fit. And uh, uh, we did all our work. The only thing you could do was to eat and sleep and play poker. And um, one of the officers there was uh, Lieutenant Stingley had made two under fire landings. And um, he carried himself well. He was a good poker player. And so... I said to him one day, Stingley, you've been under two landings under fire. I haven't been under any. Now, I'll be a greenhorn when I land for the first time. But what can you tell me that will help me make a better officer of me when I land and when we get into combat? He said, Sam, they give you this little backpack about that big. And uh, you're supposed to take your gear in. He says, don't do it. Go down to the bar, buy four bottles of screw-top whiskey, wrap them in T-shirts, put it in there. And when you get pinned down, take out a bottle, open it up, pass it around to your squad. 
it's better than more men. It's better than more ammunition. It's everybody settles. You can then get things done that you want to get done. Well, we landed on Okinawa with no fire. Um, and he said, also, he said, remember this, you take care of your men. And when you can't take care of your men, they'll take care of you. Yeah, absolutely. And I, that stuck with me. And on Guadalcanal, on Okinawa, uh, we landed, we advanced up to the airfield at Kadena, and then we pulled back and established a camp uh, near the uh, beach, and we started unloading ships. The Army gave us a radio, and they had ducks that we uh, men rode out to the ships, got unloaded the gear, and the ducks came back and forth. And we quit about midnight that night. And the next morning, uh, one of the junior officers under me, he sent me a message, hurry out to this LST, quick, quick. I thought somebody had fallen from the second deck down and busted his head open. I commandeered the first duck and ran out there and climbed up the ramp. And this officer runs over. I said, what's wrong? What's wrong? There are tons of fresh food here, and I don't know where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I know where it goes. Yeah. <laughs> so I went back and I told my sergeant, the platoon leader never showed up. <laughs> I hadn't seen the platoon leader since the time we left Guadalcanal, and we are in operation. I never saw him. And so I so to Andy, I said, take out everything we can use in a week and send the rest to the battalion. We had a crate of eggs, must have been 40 dozen. My platoon hadn't seen fresh eggs in years. The next morning, that was Monday, uh, Tuesday morning, for breakfast, we had seven chaplains. They must have smelled the eggs. <laughs> Uh, Wednesday, uh, Captain Smith came down, the company commander, and he said, Sam, didn't you get the memo that all fresh food had to go to the battalion? I said, yes, sir. He said, why didn't you send it all up there? He said, my, I said, Captain, my men were hungry. I had to feed them. Uh, okay, that was all right. I said, uh, did you send all of it to Battalion, yeah. I said, how much did you get back? None. <laughs> <laughs> so we were we were there on Okinawa until the island was secure, and then they shipped us back to Guam for R and R and wait until we were going to invade Japan. And uh, then the war was over, and uh, all the senior officers left, and I was. Uh, as a second, first lieutenant, I was second in command of battalion. They had a lieutenant colonel, then me. And we moved to Sing Tao, China. That's where the beer is made. And we, uh, the officers, uh, five of us, the captain, I mean, the command, the colonel, and four of us had a house with uh, six servants. And the, the battalion was housed in a school with 12 classes up, classrooms upstairs. 12 downstairs. So we made the upstairs the living quarters. Downstairs we opened up a school. Uh, I had young officers and we taught English, math, civics, and history. We had no books. But we had every all the, the Marines, many of them hadn't finished high school and, and the rule was you go to school or you have KP. So we didn't have anybody on KP. We used Chinese. And, uh, Dirty uh, dishes, but everyone was learning something. Yeah. <laughs> and we issued diplomas, and hopefully they, when the Marines got back to, to the States and they went in for the uh, graduate degrees, uh, graduation degrees, they would accept it. Um, and um, I was shipped back in uh, April, and... Um, uh, to uh, the Marine base in New Orleans. And I, I had two weeks of leave and went down there for discharge. And then uh, I had applied for a permanent commission you know, on Guam and they hadn't accepted me and I wanted to know why. So I went to Washington and my uh, senator got me an appointment with a colonel in the Marine barracks. 
and he explained that they just had a yes or no, and I was no, and not individuals, just a group. Uh, and um, so, <laughs> you know, being this smart ass kid, I said, okay, if you don't want me, I don't want you. I'll give up my commission. And the colonel says, Lieutenant, it doesn't work that way. We'll tell you when you can leave. As well, I was a, a learning experience. So I was staying with my cousin, and uh, she said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to loaf this summer. I've been, I've been in the service two years, and I missed a lot. She said, no, you're not. You're going to work. Because I was going back to school to get refresher courses. Little did I know they don't, you can't take a refresher course. You have to take so many hours of graduate work because you've graduated, and then you can take you can you can uh, audit courses so she said get a job so there was a building on the uh in the middle of pennsylvania avenue said jobs for veterans so i went in and told him what it was he said there's a commerce building right there go to the southeast corner second floor ask for casey jones so i went over there and everybody knew casey jones introduced myself he uh, interviewed me, and he said, I'll give you a professional grade two right away, and you will probably qualify for a professional grade three as soon as you learn your job. What am I going to do? You're going to make safety surveys of the major airports in the United States. We've never had one done. And th that was a coastal genetic survey. They, pro they produced aeronautical charts as well as nautical charts, and this was uh, – uh, an addition to the aer aeronautical charts. So um, I went home and reported uh, August the 1st. My discharge was uh, well, July the 1st. My discharge was July the 2nd. So I got an extra day of pay. And uh, they shipped me to Boston, and I did the uh, safety survey in Logan and then the Hartford, Connecticut, Albany, New York, Buffalo, Cleveland, Toledo, Detroit, Ypsilanti, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and then we had our Christmas vacation. We met again down at Vero Beach, at Daytona Beach, and at Daytona Beach, we were getting, trying to find the elevation of a tall pine tree way back in the woods, and we were walking back there, and you know how you reach down to get a piece of grass to chew on. I reached down, and one foot away was a six-foot diamondback rattlesnake. She was six feet long and a foot around. She uh -huh. had 13 little ones in her when the taxidermist opened her up. So I killed her and we had it mounted. And then I lost it in the uh, Savannah uh, YMCA. The maid said that she thought it was an empty paper bag. So we, uh, we did Charleston. We did Savannah. Then we went to Washington. But when we were in Cleveland, uh, I asked for somebody in the office to come out and show me how to clean the theodolite that they had. It wasn't something I knew. And they sent out Lieutenant Commander Pierce, who was a great, great, great grandson of President Pierce. Oh, wow. And uh, I said, you're a commission officer? He said, yeah, we have a commission service. And uh, so we talked. He stayed at the same house. In those days, there were no motels. There were hotels downtown, but they were expensive. Mm -hmm. But you went to the Chamber of Commerce, and people put their names in, and they had rooms for rent. Okay. And it was great because you stayed in these nice houses, and they were so glad to see you. And uh, so when Commander Pierce was coming out, I got him a room in the same house I was staying in. And... Uh, he told me about it, and uh, he sent me papers that I applied, and they accepted me right away. And uh, so, uh, when they got back, when I was at National Airport doing that survey, my I couldn't. You can't have two commissions, so my commission in the Coast Survey was going to be uh, September the first. So I went into the Marine Corps, and. Um, there was a brigadier general there, the same general I had met in St. Tao, China, when I had my interview. And I said, I have to resign, sir. 
uh, because I have another commission. He offered me a captain's rating right then and there on the spot. Wow. And he said, I'll give you a letter that you'll be a major within two years. I said, no, I can't. I can't do this. They've been very good to me. So uh, I joined the, I got a commission in the Coast of A and I served 30 years. Um, I had a lot of high points. One was in uh, 1950, they assigned me to a top secret project with the Air Force. We had a B-29 with a, with a 3,500 gallon gas tank in the rear Bombay. 3,500 gallons of gas is equivalent to 12 tons. And we took off from Keflavik, Iceland, never got off the ground, we went all the way across the grass strip, dropped 10 feet. The water was 10 feet below us. We didn't crash. We were flying. And uh, 20 minutes later, we had enough altitude to turn. We climbed to 20,000 feet. We had the rear of the airplane, and the, and the I, I was a project leader, the Air Force had the platform, and I was the project leader. And uh, we flew over to England, turned on the Zero Meridian, and uh, the navigator said, five minutes to the pole, we all celebrated, took pictures, and five minutes later, the whole plane shook, number three engine exploded. Didn't stop, exploded. And the en- the propeller wouldn't, we couldn't feather the pro- propeller, so it windmilled, it took the power away. So I, as a, a tunnel between the rear and the front of the airplane, I climbed up to see the pilot, and I said, uh, uh, give me a briefing. He said, we're 1,200 miles from Point Barrow. Uh, if we make it there, I can land you, but I can't get off the ground because it's too short. And I said, even with rocket assist, he said, no, Sam, it's too short. We won't try it. Hmm. So I said, what are the next options? He said, well, if we can maintain enough altitude to get over the Brooks Range, we we're only 700 miles from Fairbanks. So I said, call me when you get 30 miles from Point Barrow. So he called me, and we got over there. We dropped down to 7,500 feet, and he cut number two. And I said, what are you doing? <laughs> he said, it's running hot, and we don't want it to explode. So... um he said, but when I was up there the first time and and we were to pull, he said, tell all you, tell your crew that if we have to go down, don't bail out. We all had chutes. Don't bail out because they'll never find you. Ride the plane down. <laughs> that wasn't very good <laughs> news to go back and tell my crew. Anyway, once we got over the Brooks Range, I felt much safer because there were a lot of lakes and rivers we could land on. And then we got about 50 miles from Fairbanks. Two F-80 pilots parked their plane, looked like, on our wing and said, what's wrong, flyboy? Your rubber bands break. <laughs> and the pilot has been sitting there for almost 24 hours. And he cursed and said, get the hell out of here. I'll cut your tail off. And the controller from Fairbanks said, I'll have no cursing on the runway, on the airways. We've got smoke on the runway. You have to make a ground control approach. And the pilot says, I can't do it. I can't climb if I lose altitude. And, of course, we were all on intercom, and so we could hear this. And they fought, and he kept his altitude. And I didn't realize that that was his safety measure because if one of the engines went out, he could dive, pick up speed, and he would open up more landings, emergency landing sites. And... As we were diving, the engineer said, number four, quit. And we landed with one engine. We'd been in the air 23 hours and 47 minutes without a refueling. Wow. And seven days later, with four new engines, we were back in the air again. Uh, and then um, I went up. I was at Cape Canaveral for three years in charge of locating all the tracking devices. And no plane, no missile took off without us putting the azimuth into the guidance system. So I was involved. And um, that's where I told the children stories of my childhood of uh, raising caterpillars. And um, that's where the story of Herman the Worm came from. Yeah. And uh, 
then I went from north there to Norfolk to California, and then they assigned me to Washington office, and I had the job of director of National Genetic Survey, um, and uh, I had that for 12 years. And um, um, uh, but um, so you see, my my first job after the uh, Marine Corps was rather simple. Um, and I retired after 30 years uh, as a captain in the Coast Survey. And uh, I, uh, I remembered Stingley's remarks, take care of your troops. And I did that on board ship when I was executive officer. And every job I was on, I took care of my troops. And they reward you by better performance, and they reward you by continuing employment. When I got to Washington and took over the National Genetic Survey, which was part of the National Ocean Survey, then we merged with the Weather Bureau and became NOAA. Now it's NOAA. And um, uh, I had one professional with an advanced degree. The first year I was there, I sent eight people to college to get their advanced degree in genetic science. And when I left, 45% of the professionals were advanced degrees. That's great. We brought the, uh, back in the World War One, and the, and the, in the 20s, my organization was the world's leader in genetic science. And it eroded away and uh, it came back to the exposition by investing in the personnel. Um, little short story. When I first took over the NGS, I had three world leaders in their profession, one for leveling, one for uh, triangulation, and one for gravity and astronomy. And I called them all in with my chief scientists and I first day on duty, and I said to them, if I stopped working today and start studying, I couldn't learn as much as any one of you know by the time I'm ready to retire. So why should I? You know that. Why should I do it? I'm here to help you. You, you don't have to do anything but your professional work now. No hiring, no firing, no secretaries. I'll do all of that. You got. You want to send somebody somewhere? Don't worry about it. Just tell me. We'll take care of everything. And my chief scientist said, Sam, do you really mean that? I said, absolutely, Charlie. He said, then you'll have a success. He said, everybody else tries to tell us what to do. Right. And um, um, so I was there for 12 years. I retired. And I went to work for Teledyne. We're on a large mapping project in a Africa as a consultant. And then I went to Brookhaven National Labs, which is a high energy physics laboratory on Long Island. And um, they were building a one mile circumference uh, accelerator and they needed uh, precision surveying to locate it. And I was there for four years and they ran out of money. And so I came home and Charlie Trimble from Trimble Navigation asked me to be his salesman for his GPS. And I sold GPS for a year. And do you realize what it costs? One unit costs you $50,000. <laughs> and it took you six hours to get a position. Wow. And you had to buy three of them before I would sell it to you. <laughs> That's a hundred. And today, today your telephone has it. Yeah, it's just an app on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> now, Mister Baker, what what year roughly would that have been? That must have been one of the first or the first systems, right? It was nineteen eighty five. Okay. Uh, Charlie Trumbull is a is a story in itself. Yeah. He was legally blind at five, had a reader all through school, went to Caltech undergraduate master's and PhD in electrical engineering, and he has yet to see the chalkboard. Wow. That's a, 
that's a story in itself. Charlie and I got along well, but then he offered me a dealership, and my wife said, Sammy, Sambo, she called me Sambo, you, you've had enough, let's retire. So we t- retired. Right, right. <laughs> but uh, uh, I retired, and I bought a, a computer, and then my son had a daughter, and he said, he called me, he said, Dad, you got a computer. You can now write Herman the Worm yeah. uh, for, for your granddaughter. Yeah. And so I wrote it, and he and Sally, uh, my other child, said, it's good. And we we registered it with the Library of Congress, and I didn't do anything about it. And then uh, uh, Sally said, Dad, let's publish Herman the Worm. So uh, we published it, and... Uh, Got good reviews. It became a a, a winner on Story Master, uh, and uh, then when I was a kid, somebody gave me a white rat, and uh, you know when you say rat, you cringe. When you say mouse, it's not right. Yeah, it sounds but cuter. Yeah. <laughs> he was the cleanest animal you ever saw. She was always washing herself, and when you put new a newspaper cut up newspaper in there for her to build a nest she always went to the new and uh, i took her to school one time inside my shirt and she poked her head out and uh, somebody else saw her. <laughs> the teacher made me take her home but uh so i thought you know i read in the paper that the reading scores and the math scores of the children in this in our school now are now 17th in the world. We can't be a world leader in 17th. Plus the fact, when I was a kid, you had to have imagination to listen to radio. Right. Philip McGee and Molly had this closet oh, that yeah, they opened every McGee. day, and all the stuff <laughs> would fall out. You had to imagine that. Now you see it falling out. So yeah, how can you design something if you can't imagine it first, yeah. how can you put it on paper if you can't imagine it? Yeah. So I said, let's let's try to get children to learn to read. And uh, the banner behind me says, children who can read will succeed. And now, as you know, if they can't read by the time they're in the fourth grade, they're almost lost for the rest of their education. Reading is a foundation for everything else. Yeah. So I created this story of Oscar the Mouse, and I found a wonderful edu- uh, illustrator, and we worked well together, and we found people to color it and uh, printing it, and uh, it's been a it's been a wonderful time. And my daughter set up. Uh, a uh, website now called sambakerbooks.com. And we've, um, we now have three books. We have uh, The Silly Adventures of Herman, uh, the Petunia and Herman the Worm. We have Oscar the Mouse in English and Oscar the Mouse in Spanish. And uh, the third book, the next book coming out will be uh, Oscar Goes to the Vet. Uh, he has... Um, EBT. What is EBT? Eyes bigger than the tummy. <laughs> I love so, it. I love it. <laughs> uh, and the children can relate to that. <laughs> and uh, um, I liked it. I thought I was first at thinking about it, but my granddaughter, older granddaughter, she's 30, and my younger one is four. My old, I thought of uh, writing a book called Teach me to read, hmm. because there are a lot of adults who don't know how to read. And if we made it simple, that it wouldn't chastise them, that they could do this in their home, it would be a great thing. She says, Granddaddy, they already have something similar to that. Well, we can't be a, continue to be a world leader if our Children can't read. Uh, sure, artificial intelligence will do a lot. Uh, computers will do a lot. 
they can make up for some of the the lack of, of knowledge, but we need we need leaders to lead, and they have to know how to read. And um, uh, it's been my enjoyment to pass out books and to give books to teachers to to encourage the children and make them think and and reestablish their imagination. You know, I'm a hundred years old. Oh God bless and, you. Yeah. And uh, I don't have much time left on this earth. I'd like to uh, to be, live a few years longer because I uh, I have a solution to the water problem in Arizona. I like to see it <laughs> come to fruition. Uh, also, I have a, a patent. I hope we get my son and I have a patent pending uh, for a new football helmet hmm. that. Um, uh, reduces the impact a tremendous amount. So, you know, I've got a lot of irons in the fire, far, bit more, far more than I need to do. But uh, that's uh, that's the story of my life so far. Well, I'll tell you. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing, Paul. The greatest gift God gave to man was a loving wife. Amen. Children are great. I, I love my children, and I'm glad we had them. I'm, I married Janet was 30 and I was 33 when we got married for the first time, both of us. Um, if we'd have been married uh, five or six years earlier, we'd probably had a, a half a dozen kids uh, because we love them. But uh, I met her and I fell in love with her almost immediately. Why I waited a year to marry, I don't know. Uh, if she would have said, Sambo... Let's get married, I'd say, tonight or tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, she encouraged me. She never let me be in the dumps. And uh, we had a great life together. And uh, she moved seven times the first year of marriage. Oh, uh, oh here's the school teacher. Hold on. Can, I, can you call me back in... 30 minutes, I'm on an interview. Yeah. Um, Janet moved seven times her first year of marriage, 17 times in our marriage. Wow. Now, you have to love somebody to do that. Absolutely. But she used to tell the children every time we move, wonderful, we're going to go to a new place. We're going to meet new friends. We're going to see new things. And they bought it. Yeah. And... Uh, I had a wonderful career, and I've had a wonderful retirement. Uh, I wonder, why was I so lucky? Uh, my older sister died. At, my mother died at, 30, at 52. My father at 65. My older sister at 42. My little sister at 80. My, old, my second sister just died last November at 103. Uh, uh, colon cancer was prevalent in the family and I've had so many colonoscopies uh, I can tell you the routine <laughs> uh, but uh, I try to enjoy every day of my life uh, I don't think there's a secret as to why you can live longer I I think that it's in your genes or it's in your makeup. Uh, I I don't smoke and I don't drink, but I love women. And um, uh, God has just uh, uh, given me this life and I appreciate it. Uh, I don't want to change anything. Uh, and uh, it's been a wonderful time being a veteran. I tell you, uh, many things can make your heart pump a little faster, but when you somebody sees that uh, you are a hundred years old and a vet, and they say thank you for your service, it makes your heart pump a little faster for a while. Yeah. And uh, I've been the uh, oldest Marine at the Marine birthday party for Phoenix area for the last four years. 
but I wish somebody else would come in because there's only one place to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now I've taken up the stage. Now, what do you, you must have some questions. Well, you, you, you answered most of them. I mean, you, you've shared your, your life story with us. I thank you so much for that time. You've talked about your travels. You talked about some people that you served with that inspired you and, and taught you some things. And I guess my only question now is looking back at everything that you just discussed, if there was some type of time machine or a portal where you were able to have just a moment with yourself before you joined the Marine Corps, is there any fun little preview or tip or, or warning, perhaps, something you would say to yourself before you joined? No. No? Just go for it? All. Just go for I it. I was <laughs> the, the, the patriotism on the campus when the, the, the Japanese struck uh, was so overwhelming. If we could have that. Uh, that era of patriotism continue in our country, we would have far less problems. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. You know, yeah, Admiral Yamamoto of Japan told the Japanese war board, don't mess with the United States. You'll, you'll awaken a giant. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly true. It's amazing how many airplanes, tanks, ships, aircraft carriers that we built in that some from the time the Japanese attacked until the war was over. Yeah, yeah it was a huge effort by everyone. I mean, that whole generation was completely consumed with being united and had one mission in mind. Yeah. Why can't we go back to that? Yeah, I wish I knew the answer people, to that one. Yeah. People who have no connection to saving or bettering this country are now trying to lead it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I certainly appreciate you sharing this incredible story. And, um, and I understand you on a, a bet. Yes, sir. Yeah. I served myself uh, with the army, army national guard and spent some time overseas. And it's uh, it's, as you know, it's, it's a life changing uh, chapter because you, you learn things about yourself. you learn things about others. You learn compassion, empathy, you go through things with other people and, uh, and you, and you miss it for, for a, a bulk of the time uh, afterwards, you, you miss that camaraderie. One of the many yeah. reasons that I enjoy the show so much is I get to sit with a <laughs> veteran like yourself and, it's it's as if we have some type of shared DNA. We 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 did something similar at one point that we can recognize in each other, and it just kind of it's just kind of a fun it's a fun way to get along. Yes, well, uh, I limit my travel now. I limit uh, where I go. I still drive. Well, do you? I yeah. don't drive at night. I don't drive at night. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, nobody here at the at the retirement home will ride with me. Yeah. <laughs> but I still drive, uh, and uh, uh, my license is good until August of this year, and uh, I'll have to decide then. Do I want to take an exam? Because they said now I have to take an exam, sure. driver's exam. But I don't think that's any problem. I only have one eye. My left eye is was lost uh, back in the generation. Uh, and it makes driving a little odd because you can't see uh, anything on my left side. I have to turn my head so the right will see it. But um, life is good. And and I'm so happy that, that I'm here. And I have more friends here at the retirement home than I had at any time in my life. That's wonderful. That's fantastic. And, uh, um, it was uh, when Janet passed. It was a, it was a big blow. Uh, uh, I became a hermit in the house because uh, I would say, "Oh, I better go out and meet this guy." No, no, I got something in the refrigerator. Finally, I said to my daughter, 
who came to live with me, I said, I got to leave. So I found this place and moved in. Yeah. And it's nice. And um, I met a lot of people. And um, um, and if uh, when God thinks it's time for me to come, uh, leave here, okay. Um, I would like to see more children learn to read. And uh, I'd like to see our uh, math scores improve. But um, then you got the, uh, you probably have your children and uh, you have this this discussion. Um, if you can find it on your telephone or in your computer, why do you need to know it? Well, that's possible. Today I'm on a breakfast group. Today, one man said, um, AI is so advanced that it's almost to the point where if you put a, a, a world expert in a subject here and an AI in this room over here, and both of them, you ask them a question, and both of them send you a question, an answer, it's almost to the point you can't tell the difference. Yeah. So. That's something. Yeah. So what are we going to do with all the people that we don't need? Mm-hmm. Or what's going to happen when AI starts building AIs? Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you're getting ready to write a sci-fi novel now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been such a joy, and you are yeah. uh, a wonderful host. And well, thank I, you, thank you, Mr. Baker. It was an honor to have you. It really was. Sam, Sam. Okay, and and I'll make sure that um, you know we'll go ahead and put a link to your site so folks can check out your books and your writings and anything else that you're up to. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I thank you, and um, it's just been an absolute yeah. honor and p- pleasure. Where are you located? Uh, we're up in, in Buffalo, New York. That's where the radio station uh, broadcasts. It's the old uh, WBR call sign up here, and it's uh, the station is actually owned by a veteran as well. I I did the safety survey at the airport at Buffalo. Yeah, yeah well, you mentioned the, that. I didn't want to in, interrupt, but you mentioned the in, Buffalo in the airport. summer summer of 40, uh, 44, uh, 46. Mm-hmm. and. Uh, we I took the uh, what's the name of the boat that goes under the falls? Oh, the mate of the mist, probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I did that and took some pictures up there. Uh, it's uh, you know, before I left to go to the Marine Corps, I never been more than 150 miles from home. Yeah, and look at all the traveling you've done. Holy cow! Oh, <laughs> I've been in every state in the Union. Yeah, that's fantastic. And. and uh, uh, the government has some wonderful programs. And uh, what did you do when Buffalo got four feet of snow? Well, I wish it was only four feet, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we had over six and a half around the house. It, wow. Yeah, you had it, a tunnel to get out. We did. There was, I mean, luckily I have more than one door, but two of the doors were completely buried and I had to kind of tunnel my way out to, to clear it out. Everybody had the same deal over here. It was a, it was a ton. Cause you have the, the Great Lakes, you know, you had the lake effect. And then the wind just carried that so much farther in than we had seen in probably a good 40 years. I think wow. the, mo- the most recent storm that was close to this was back in 77. There was a huge blizzard. Um, not as much footage and video of that one as this one, of course. So some folks are saying they were pretty equal, but it was, tr- it was a tremendous storm. At six inches of rain. Oh yeah, so, then it then it melted, and then you had to worry about the wet basements and the drains and all that. So it was quite yeah. remarkable. But we were fortunate and um, safe and secure. But you know, we're we're the lucky ones for sure. Yeah, thank God for natural gas yeah. and electricity yeah, for sure. And uh, uh, and a shout out to those uh, utility workers that come to work and keep your your things going i had uh, just a little side note uh in uh in the late 60s the uh engineer for uh uh houston power and light called me and he said uh 
Captain, can we get your crew down here to do some precise leveling? And I said, why do you need it? He said, to, to manufacture gasoline takes so much ga uh, natural water. And we are they're pumping so much underground water, Houston is settling. Hmm. And when the water pipes break, it's all right. They send the water to the surface. When gas pipes break, you don't know they broke until they explode. So he said, we need precise leveling over areas. So they gave us a quarter of a million dollars a year to send our leveling crew down there and doing leveling for a number of years. So I got involved in the water issue then. And of course, up in Napa Valley, we did a resurvey there in Tucson. Uh, and then uh, parts of California, they pump so much water, the pump is 10 feet above the ground. Mm. Um, it's a water issue that we need to settle. And I think I have a partial solution. So I'll write that up. Mm. That's fantastic. <laughs> it's, it's been a wonderful time. Uh, one of the best uh, interviews I've had. Well, thank, thank you, you so sir. much. I, I appreciate it. appreciate your time. God bless you. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what you do with the next century here. This is uh, <laughs> quite remarkable. You've kept the high temple. You've made the Marine Corps very proud. Yeah, well, I enjoyed my uh, time in the Marine Corps. Uh, and just look at events. What if they'd accepted me at a permanent commission? Yeah. I would have had a different life after, instead of Kosovo and Noah, I would have had Marine Corps, and I would have been in South, uh, been in the Korean War, the Vietnam War, <laughs> and, and, the, and all the others. Yeah, well, God, God moved you where He needed you to do your best work, and you've certainly, you've certainly achieved that. So, thank you so much. I thank you so much. God bless, and and afterwards, I'll go ahead and send Sally the uh, the file. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. God bless. Have you. a great day. You too. Thanks. Bye bye.